Today we continue our sermon series entitled, How Firm a Foundation. And the foundation we're going to be looking at today is the foundation of absolute truth. The whole goal of this series is to pursue what we call a biblical worldview, simply a lens, a framework by which we are able to view all of life, but a framework or a lens that is grounded and informed by the infallible word of God. As we look at the foundation of absolute truth, we need to start with the definition of an absolute. I wanna suggest this definition. An absolute is an unchanging point of reference or standard by which you gauge right or wrong. So therefore, if that is the definition of an absolute, absolute truth is unchanging truth regardless of the culture, unchanging truth regardless of the time in history, but an unchanging truth by which we are able to determine right from wrong. To look at the foundation of absolute truth, we turn our attention to 1 John 18, chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. This is the same John that writes the Gospel of John. This is the same John that writes the Revelation of St. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. As John writes these epistles, he is near the end of his life. He is an old man. And he's an old man writing to little children. If you've never studied 1 John before, he often refers to the recipients of this letter as his little children. And he is writing this epistle as a father would write out of concern to his children, who are his children. They are his spiritual children that are being led astray by the false teaching that is besetting the church in Asia Minor. And just as a father would have concern for his children being swayed away from the true faith, he writes to them so that they might be certain and they might hold fast to the faithfulness of God and the truth of his word. Let's turn our attention to 1 John chapter 2, 18. Through 27. This is the word of God. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they're not of us. But you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. You see what John is doing, he's linking Father and Son together, that you cannot believe in God, the Father, without believing in God, the Son. You can't say, I believe in God, but I reject Jesus Christ, the brilliance of John. Verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise. That he, who, that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as to his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God, his source of absolute truth, endures forever, amen. It's no surprise to anyone here today or listening at home that we are living in a time and experiencing the most rapid change in the history of the world. Things are moving at such a rapid pace, it leaves us to wonder, is there anything that is true today? Will it be true tomorrow? 
is what is true this morning, will it be true a thousand years from now? Our culture says this, what's true for you doesn't have to be true for me. We can coexist. The culture loves the word coexist. We can coexist in a world where you define what is true, that we can believe in polar opposite truths and they can still be true, both be true at the same time. After all, truth is relative. Truth is subjective. But Jesus says, I beg to differ. He said, my word is truth, and his word is unchanging. He says, if you abide in my word, which is true, then you are my disciple, and you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. I want to ask you this morning, do you know this truth, the absolute truth of an absolute God, and has it set you free this morning? Three things I want us to look at briefly concerning absolute truth. The reality of absolute truth, the suppression of absolute truth, and the perseverance of absolute truth. First John, we look and we see the reality of absolute truth. There is such a thing in a culture that says all truth is relative. There is such a thing as absolute truth. That's why Jesus is able to say, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's able to say, Father, sanctify them in the truth. In the passage that we read in verse 21, he says, I write these things to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, because you have it. Notice John doesn't say uh, the truth is in the eye of the beholder. He doesn't say that truth is up to you to define whether it is true or not. He doesn't say it's true because you believe it or because it works in your system of thought. He says truth is not dependent upon you. There is a truth and you have received it. There is a truth and you know it. You see, the Bible teaches that ultimate absolute truth is not dependent upon you. It's not true because you like it. It's not true because you believe it. It is totally separate from you. And what the Bible teaches us is that truth does not conform to you, but that you conform to the truth, where there is a price to be paid. You might say, I've heard of the law of gravity, but when in an airplane, I am going to open the door and just jump out and see what happens. There will be a price to be paid. I could look at that wall and say, I know it's a wall, but I'm going to run right through it. There will be a price to be paid. You see, none of us are foolish enough to believe that all truth is simply relative or subjective or up to us to define whether it is true or not. And John is writing this letter to implore his church, to implore God's people to hang on to the absolute truth in the midst of a culture that has rejected truth to hold fast to it. But what was the truth that they were rejecting? We're told that the truth that they were rejecting in verse 22 is the absolute truth that Jesus is the Christ. Why is this foundational to John and ultimately foundational to us this morning? What is so significant about the absolute truth that Jesus is the Christ? Well, Christians for 2,000 years have been making this claim, and this is the reality of that claim, that if Jesus is the Christ, then he must be divine. And if the divine is absolute, then Jesus is absolute. And everything that flows from Jesus is absolute. This is why this has been one of the cardinal truths and cardinal tenets of the Christian worldview. You deny that Jesus is the Christ and Christianity falls apart. And this was the foundational truth that Jesus is absolute, that Jesus is the author, source, determiner, arbiter, ultimate standard, and final judge of all truth. And so whatever flows from Jesus is absolute. 
Therefore, we don't have the option to say things like, I'm a Christian, but you don't have that right because what flows from the mouth of Jesus is true because he is the embodiment of truth. He is truth incarnate because he and the Father are one. Now, you might also be sitting here this morning and say, what's, what's the big deal about absolute truth? I, I think we can coexist in a world, in a culture, in a society without absolute truths. Oh, really? If two people do not have an ultimate standard or an absolute truth to appeal to, it all comes down to who has the most power. It's all subjective. This is what we call tyranny. You don't believe me? Just ask those that have lived under the atheistic communist regimes of the Soviet Union and China that has murdered over 100 million people in the last century. What happens when you deny the absolute? What happens when you deny absolute truth? It is the survival of the fittest. It is tyranny. To have a culture and a society that rejects the absolute, that rejects the existence of an absolute being, that rejects the existence of absolute truth, the only thing we can do is tremble for a society and a culture that exists as such. It is the Christian worldview alone that delivers to humanity what they have been searching for for thousands of years. Without absolute truth, there is no objective morality. Without absolute truth, there is no answer for justice. There is no objective love, and there certainly is no objective forgiveness. All of hum the things that humanity has been searching for for thousands of years is simply a vain pursuit without absolute truth, without objectives. It's why millions of Christians have given their lives for this absolute truth, truth that is ab absolute, objective, and ultimate, because it is only this truth that will set you free. The second thing we see in this passage is not only the reality of absolute truth, but the suppression of absolute truth. John is quite severe in his language of verse 22. He calls people that deny absolute truth liars. We don't use language like this today. People that disagree with us, we say they simply have a difference of opinion. We're much more polite, much more subtle. John calls them out as a liar. Now we need to understand what's happening here. What is a liar? A liar is someone that knows the truth, but acts as if they don't. So why wouldn't John just say they're ignorant or they're blind or they just don't know any better? Well, we find our answer in Romans chapter one. Paul gives us the reason for why John calls them a liar. Romans one verse 18 and 19, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What Paul is teaching us and what John is saying here is that there's no such thing as atheist. People that act as if there is no God are simply suppressing the truth of God in their unrighteousness because deep down inside they are just playing a game as if God does not exist because they know better. You ever gone through a stop sign or a red light? Nobody does those actions flippantly, but in the back of your mind, you're always asking yourself, am I gonna get caught? Am I guilty? Am I gonna be found out? Why? Because deep down inside, whether you believe in a God or not, you know the natural laws of man. You know the natural laws of God that has been written on every man's heart. That deep down inside, you know the difference between right and wrong. Deep down inside, you know that there is a truth. And the atheists, what they simply do is act as if he doesn't exist. The world says there is no God, but no matter how adamant they are, deep down inside they know better. They suppress the absolute truth in their unrighteousness. So we not only see the reality of absolute truth, we not only see the suppression of absolute truth, which John calls, out, calls them out as liars, but lastly, we see the perseverance of absolute truth. 
You notice all throughout chapter two that this is a message to abide. He's calling his children to hold fast, to persevere to the end. And what John is calling them to, he's reminding them that the only way you can persevere in this weird, wild world, this world of confusion and chaos, is to cling to the truth. For if the truth is absolute, then those that abide in that absolute truth will abide and persevere to the end. The only way we can persevere and abide is to know and to cling to that truth. I don't think it's any surprise to anyone listening to this message this morning, being a Christian is hard. Being a parent seems impossible at times, particularly in this cultural moment. And we need to cling and hold fast to the absolute truths of God's word in order to survive, in order to persevere, to fight the good fight, to finish the race, in order to face the great trials and adversities of our day so that we are swimming, not with the culture, but against the culture because we're able to abide and persevere with the absolute truth of God. But John here gives us three practical applications of how we can abide and persevere. John says in verse 20, for instance, God's given us the Holy Spirit He says, you've been anointed in verse 20. You've been anointed by the Holy One. The word anointing is the action and the activity of the third person of the Trinity. The what is the job of the the Spirit? The job of the Holy Spirit is to anoint us and to apply the benefits of Christ to us, to serve as our counselor and to convict us so that when we are tempted, to walk away from the absolute truth, when we are tempted to buy into the lies of our world, we have the spirit of the living God within us. That's why every single day, we need to be crying out, spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon me. Spirit of the living God, would you fall afresh upon my marriage and upon my children and my home and my business? Because we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to convict us and to counsel us, to remind us of the absolute truth of God. The second thing that God has given us is his word. Verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. What have they heard? They've heard the scriptures. It's why here at Coral Ridge, I say it so often, why we open up the scriptures on Sunday morning why we have Bible study, why we have Sunday school class, why we, we are so, so um, quick to point our families to the word of God as the only rule of faith and practice. It's why we memorize, study, and meditate and allow us to persevere because the word of God is in us. It's why as a church we need to be immersed in the word of God. Parents and grandparents, We have the preventative medicine to fight against the allure of this world. What are we doing to feed our children and our grandchildren, the next generation, with this word that allows them to abide? And third and lastly, we're told that we have the church. Verse 19, it says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Where did they go out from? They went out from the fellowship of believers. What John is saying is that God has given us this, Lord's Day worship, the community of the saints, the the fellowship of believers. That's why the author of the book of Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling. That's why for 2,000 years, God's people have gathered together and the call of John is don't abandon the family because the family is exactly what you need in order to persevere, that you wouldn't buy the lie that you can live life apart from your church family and survive. I know it's hard to get here. I know for some of you, especially those that have little ones, it seems like it's almost an impossible chore to be here on Sunday morning, but don't buy the lie of the culture that you can blow this off 
that this is not important. It is God's means of grace to us in order for them to abide. So that when we send our children off to college, they are not walking away from the faith, but through the fellowship and through the word and the power of the Holy Spirit being spoken over them in their lives, they might hold fast and cling to the God that is forever clinging to them. It's why in a few moments, we'll celebrate a meal. We celebrate a family meal together here at Coal Ridge so that our hungry souls together might be fed. During World War II, children were being displaced by the thousands. And because so many children were being displaced in every community, they were building makeshift orphanages. And one of the things they found is that the children, because of the severe trauma of being separated from family, they would not be able to fall asleep at night. But they discovered that the only way that a child could fall asleep was placing a piece of bread in their hand. And when they placed, placed the piece of bread in their hand, they whispered in their ear, child, you're safe. You already have tomorrow's bread. Child, you can fall asleep on this dark night. God will hold you fast. In just a few minutes, you will hold the bread. And I will say the most audacious thing. I will say that the creator God is the God that knows you and loves you. That the creator God came down as a man and broke his body for you so that you could survive in this dark world, so that you could survive throughout the chaos of this life, so that you could abide and persevere till the very end, so that you can forever rest in him. The creator God saying to you, this is my body given for you. Why would we say such a thing? Because it's the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I pray that the absolute, unchanging, objective truth of God would be the very thing that set us free. That, Lord, we wouldn't look to the philosophies and the ways of this world to find freedom and to find hope. There is no hope in the subjective thoughts, in the relative truths that are developed by this world. But we need an absolute truth that gives us a firm foundation in a world that is constantly changing, in a culture that's constantly moving. We need something that never changes. We need something that is forever stable and steady. It is Jesus Christ, the rock. May our lives be grounded by this rock, the only firm foundation, an absolute truth, a standard of truth that will be forever, that we can bank our lives on and set us free forever. If there's someone here this morning or someone watching at home that has never encountered this Jesus, maybe they've lived their lives suppressing the truth, trying to act as if this God does not exist. Lord, I pray that the hound of heaven would bring them home right now open their eyes and soften their hearts so that they would no longer suppress this truth, but receive the truth that became a man, Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. No one can get to the Father but through me. May they be saved and rescued and have real hope and experience real forgiveness for the first time forevermore. We pray all these things in the name of Christ, amen.